It was cold every day. Though, I assume that's the case whenever you spend every day in a research facility in the Arctic. They told us we were here to record the ice sheets sizes as they shrank, but I'm not entirely sure why. I've seen the Facebook feeds of all the Dullards and Philistines. They don't believe us. Social policy doesn't shift to meet us and our findings. No one cares. Still, there we were, freezing our respective genitals off in ridiculously low temperatures. That's alright, Karen. Please finish your latte and tell me exactly how it is. You know better than us. Go on, seriously. I think it's a bit funny that we were sent up here on federal grants from the good old USA. You may not believe our findings, but you sure are paying for them. So, there it is. That's not all we were up there for, though. It seems that was what we were doing at first, but as we began to record crazy seismic activity, our focus shifted to that instead. Initially, it seemed as though it was just periphery nonsense that we were picking up on our instruments, but it continued. The government suits came in and we worked under the mushroom style of management the US government enjoys implementing most. Feed your employees crap and keep them in the dark. We were already working on the government dime, so not much changed. Everything just felt a lot more hush-hush. It had been at least a week since the last transmission, and the storm wasn't landing up anytime soon. We all knew that. The animals knew it too. The sled dogs became lethargic and whimpered as we checked in on them. They would pace and refuse to touch their kibble. Things got weird outside sometimes though, just the way that it goes. Sometimes you think you see things in the snow and then you turn back to look at it and it's nothing. But sometimes it is. I'm getting carried away with myself when I talk of such things, I apologize. The thing that gets me more than anything is the wild loneliness you feel. It's maddening some days, but I suppose that should have been something to be prepared for. I'm not so sure any amount of preparation would have done it though. You expect the loneliness to be sure, but the thing you really don't expect is exactly how crazy your own mind goes in it. You know there won't be enough people to save the average human equivalent, but the worst is within you. It's enough to drive you up a wall. I am rambling though, so I'll get on with it. We were a team of 11 in the beginning, but during the shift rotation, we were left with five. Me, that is. Andrew Warden, a junior researcher. Anthony Finkel, the lead. Jennifer Jones, another junior. Amber Darling. Not sure how someone ends up with a surname like that and the helicopter pilot. Donovan Plant, technical officer sent in after the pickup in Seismic. He notably came from a military background, and it felt as though he was deeper in the government's pocket than anyone else. There we were, expecting another round of professionals to come in, and that dang storm came down on us almost like it knew what it was doing. The weather itself knew that we would be trapped up there, and we lost communication. But that didn't matter, as we knew they wouldn't bring the next batch of fresh-faced researchers with the storm the way it was. It never seemed to let up. A constant whistle blew across the metal panels that made up the front entrance of the facility. You could get further away from the noises of the storm if you delved deeper into the facility underground. It was warmer there too. And for a brief moment, maybe you could forget you were on top of the world in the middle of a blizzard. We hardly talked to one another, only congregating in the mess hall to eat together, normally in muttering silence. Mostly, I devoured books that I had already read, and the other team members were taken away in their own hobbies. The storm bugged most of our equipment out, so it wasn't as though we could get much work done beyond recording temperature and making sure the seismograph kept a steady reading. Anthony tended his bonsai, Amber knitted, Jennifer tended to the dogs, and Donovan kept his door shut and locked so I couldn't really say what he did in there while the rest of us were filling our time. 
The first meaningful conversation I had had in a long time was with Jones as we were peers. It was in the sterile mess hall as I attempted to keep an eye on the open page of Metamorphosis while also spooning hunks of chopped spaghetti into my mouth. I was doing a rather poor job of this, constantly dropping sauce into my lap. She slid into the seat across from me with a bowl, rubbing her hands together after removing her gloves. I couldn't help it. My interest was piqued. Why the gloves? I rumbled while closing the book and looking up at her. Her cheeks were veiny red. Jones lifted her warm bowl with her hands, letting out a satisfying sigh. She peeked over the bowl at me. Have you been out lately? I leaned in. No, there's a storm out there, in case you've not noticed. I know. She set the bowl down. Still, I think you should go outside sometime. I swear there's something out there. She shuddered as she spooned the food into her mouth and sucked on her spoon absently. What are you talking about? I raised an eyebrow. She grinned and leaned in towards me. There are people out there. I swear it. You've got to go out there. I'll take you. You've got to see them. There's no one out there. I furled my brow at her, completely forgetting my book and setting it next to me on the bench. She pointed her spoon at me. You sure about that? You've been up there. I shook my head. I'll show you tomorrow. She took another mouthful from the bowl. Don't tell anyone. Jones whispered this part and decided to continue her meal alone in her room. As she left the canteen and disappeared down the hall, I watched her baffled. What? I said. There weren't people out in the storm. What sort of asinine crap was that? I wrapped my fingertips across the tabletop and wondered whether Jones had a touch of the madness. That was a distinct possibility. It could creep up on any one of us at any time. Wandering around in a blizzard was a way for it to manifest. I took my bowl to the sink basin and washed it, leaving it on the rack to dry. After returning to my room, I tossed the book onto the metal bedside table and I lied in bed. Even after clicking my light off, I couldn't sleep though. I paced for longer than I'd care to admit, thinking that I ought to turn Jones into Fink. Fink would know what to do. He was a brilliant yet compassionate man. Would we quarantine her? I couldn't be sure. None of us knew when the next batch would show up. Call it curiosity, boredom. Perhaps I too had been touched by the maddening effects that the place kept. I decided to meet with Jones in the morning and go out there. After making my decision, sleep came easier. The following morning, I bundled in layers and crept past the others' rooms, then the canteen. I could hear clanking utensils as they ate their breakfast. Reaching the mouth of the facility, I found Jones at the sled dog pens, roughing the neck of a shabby-looking mutt with curly black and white fur. He looked around happily, wagging his tail. The storm picked up outside and he tucked his tail as the overhead fluorescent lights flickered. It's okay, boy said Jones, offering her hand to palm down. He brushed his face into it, and she gathered his head in both hands, scratching his jaw on either side. His tongue lolled back and forth. So, I said, making my presence known. People outside, huh? That's right, she said. I saw them a few days ago. Jones lifted herself from her hunkered position and wiped her hands down on the front of her pants. I thought for sure I was losing my mind, but they are out there. Humanoid figures. You mean humans. Humanoid figures that don't exist. I corrected. Sure, humans. I saw them a few days ago and tried ignoring them, but every time I look out there, she motioned to the window near the facility's arched doorway. I couldn't see anything but thick snow whipping across the glass's surface in violent bouts. They were out there, 
The figures are the only thing I can't rationalize. That's impossible. Without a doubt, it's totally impossible, Joan said. So? So, there is still out there, she shrugged. If you ask me, governmental experimentation. What? Hear me out. She put up her hands with a coy twinkle of her immaculate teeth. Probably I'm paranoid or something. Probably I'm totally wrong, alright? But I think this is some sort of localized blizzard. I think the government is testing out weaponized weather. That's what makes sense to me. Given the look in her eye, I could tell she was mostly joking. There was something like a hopeful glimmer there though and I could tell the thought of something so sensational moved the gears of her imagination. That's illegal. I shook my head. Lots of things are illegal. When the government does something, it's not. I've seen your file. You've worked in the public sector long enough, so I would say you know that better than anyone. Localized, weaponized weather, I said, holding my chin in, tugging at the thin beard transpiring there. Letting the words dangle in the air, that way they would fully cement in my mind. That's insane. You're insane. She laughed heartily, flapping her gloves against her bundled tummy. I mean, probably. Doesn't change the fact that I've seen humanoid... Humans. Right. It doesn't change the fact that I've seen humans out there. She paused to slip into her thick gloves. So, I tried going out to them yesterday, but no matter how far I went, I couldn't see their details. They look like black outlines in the snow. So... So, I need your help. I needed someone else to come with me. I don't want to get lost out in that storm. You want to get both of us lost in the storm. At least if that happens, I won't be lost by myself, right? This was a death wish. Without a doubt, I was sure of that. But why had I come up here? I knew why, and she knew why too. The talk of these strange figures out in the blizzard had me extremely interested. I moved across the white dusted floor and wiped at the window near the door with my glove, scraping the frost off. I peered out, squinting my eyes. I waited for it. I waited for the humanoid figures to show themselves out there. Nothing. I couldn't see anything out there in that storm but wild white wind. Just as I began to tell Jones that I intended to have breakfast with the others, I saw them standing out there, unmoving. There was maybe two or three of them, the vaguest outlines of people. Arms, legs, heads. No way. There was no way I should have been able to see anything in that. Unless... Unless the storm was localized somehow. And the reach of the blizzard didn't touch out past maybe 40 yards. 40 yards, listen to me. 40 yards in a blizzard that thick might as well have been a million. Jones came up on my shoulder. You see them too, huh? I jerked at her presence and took a step back from the window. Yeah, yeah, I see them. It could be a simple case of pareidolia, I offered. She nodded. Could be. It could be several things. Pareidolia, cabin fever, polar madness specifically. And believe me, I thought about all of that. The only thing that's supposed to be out there is the chopper. I don't know about you, but those don't look anything like a chopper to me. I studied Jones's face and saw she was on point. Her brow was rigid, and her eyes were unmoving. She was determined. Repulling her hair into a tighter bun, she donned a thick woven cap. Ready? Gosh dang it. I slapped my gloves against my hands, but eventually slid into them. She grabbed the door handle as I was still placing the goggles over my face. Remember to stay close. The worst thing we can do is lose each other out there. She paused. I set up a line yesterday. 
It goes out maybe 20 or 30 meters. It was difficult alone. Twisting the door's a big flat metal handle with the full weight of her body. It came swinging in and I was immediately met with the stiff wind of the blizzard. Even in my layers, I knew it was going to be a miserable excursion. I barreled into the wind with my shoulder, feeling the chill cut straight through me. Gritting my teeth, I reached out with a stiff arm, searching the blind white air for the lady that she had mentioned. It was a panicked eternity that I was reaching out with my gloved fingers, before I felt them wrap around the hard metal of a waist-high post. Running the length of the guidepost, I found the line and took it in both hands. This was it. If I let go and scrambled into the whipping snow, I'd be lost forever. Behind, I felt these searching arms of Jones. She was flailing around, keeping one hand in the line. I grabbed a hold of her with the other, leading her hand to it. And quickly, I grasped onto the line again, terrified. It's a similar feeling of drowning. Total hopelessness all around you. I shimmied my feet along, creating a small path in the heavy snow. Why did I have to go first? I fought my neck against the wind, beating against my frayed hood as I came to the end of the line and peered out into the storm, holding one hand cupped around my face to help me see. They were the figures, strong, unmoving. They must have been statues. That was the only explanation. Something was moving us along out there in that storm. Something wanted us out there. Something wanted us to find these things. I felt Jones bump into my back and grab my shoulder, looking past me. There, you can see them a little clearer now. She yelled directly into my ear. Even with the minimal space between us, I could scarcely hear her over the scream of the wind. Are they statues? I asked. They look like it. It's clearer out today. I'm going to go check them out. Hold on to the end of the line and keep me in sight. If you lose me, get help. I let go of her and staggered into the snow before she could protest. Looking back even now, I wonder what was wrong with me. No one goes out there like that alone. That's a surefire way to kill yourself. I didn't care, I suppose. I was driven by a sense of adventure in an otherwise mind-numbing existence. The storm continuously pushed against me and I fought it watching my feet steadily. I could already feel my muscles burning from the exertion, but I convinced myself that if I maintained my nerves and didn't lose my sense of direction while taking my steps carefully, I'd be fine. And that's when I bumped directly into one of the figures and almost set myself cartwheeling in the snow. I instead found myself on one knee, leaning over the obscured form of a humanoid figure it didn't move. It was frozen. I held on to the stiff leg of the figure and looked to my left and right. Three other frozen figures to my left, two others to the right. And then there was the one that I was kneeling over. Six altogether. Humanoid forms of varying heights and builds. I felt a hand grab my shoulder hard and I almost fell over in terror as I was sure that was one of these figures had come to life and it was coming to get me. It was Jones. She had left the line. What are you doing? I screamed at her. Finko's at the end of the line over there. She spit through the cold. He said to come and get you. Looks like the jig is up. Could I almost hear a laugh in her voice? Who knows? I relaxed and took a moment to regroup. Help me. What? She said. Help me. Get this thing's leg over there. I've got this one. We set about the arduous task of dragging the frozen figure through the thick snow, only circling around in confusion once. We saw Fickle at the end of the line, holding a light and waving it all around. There! Screamed Jones. As we met Fickle, he called out gruffly, What the heck are you doing out here? Here, I said, help us get this thing in. It was hard to tell, but I'm sure the lead was shaking his head, 
as he hunkered down and began aiding in our efforts to move the heavy statue-like figure. Darling slammed the door shut and the wind outside was muffled. I shed my hood and goggles and gloves, rubbing my hands together while blowing hot breath into them. I watched as Jones followed suit. A figure lay on the floor, stiff with both arms at its sides, staring at the ceiling blindly. It was ice. It was an ice statue. I looked around at the other faces of the research team, and they too were all momentarily intrigued by the statue. Finkel tugged at his belt. Now why don't you tell me what you two were doing out there during a dang blizzard? I looked at Jones and we locked eyes. We saw those things out there, she said. There are others out there. This isn't the only one. Wild stuff if you ask me. And you thought you could just go on a little trek without letting the rest of us know, stammered Finkel while stroking his thick peppered beard. Have you lost your minds? Still shaking his head, he crossed the room and now to examine the ice statue. When he looked back at us, his expression had softened substantially. All right, all right. You see this thing out there and go get it. What now? Joan shrugged and made the noise for her. I don't know. This will be going into my folder, sir, said Donovan to Finkel. Finkel waved this off. I'm sure it will. Everything does, doesn't it? He lifted the light from his belt and shined it at the statue's bulbous, featureless face. This isn't made out of ice, he said calmly. It's coated in the stuff. He sighed and wiped his dribbling nose with a sniff. There's a person under there. God dang it. There's a person under there. He repeated his words. I stepped over to look at the figure. It was true. With him shining his light into the thing's face, I could just make out the two blue eyes and open mouth and nose. There was a human somewhere under all that, no doubt. Jesus, whispered Darling. Who is it? None of us could tell as the glass-like reflective quality of its form did not afford the distinction of specific features. Finkel investigated the body with his coarse, thick fingers. Never seen anything like this before. It looks like somebody poured water over them and kicked them out into the blizzard. God, look at this. The coating of ice is so thick. How does something like this happen? Mine and Joan's insubordination seemed forgotten, at least for the moment. I looked at her, but her eyes were transfixed on the statue. This wasn't the sort of thing she had been looking for. This was horrific. This was death. Who did that? What did that? We lifted the statue and carried it to the infirmary, laying it out on one of these sleek metal tables, surrounding it with heaters. Not wanting to watch the thing melt, I took myself to the canteen and settled into a corner with a warm butter biscuit. I hadn't noticed, but Jones had followed me, startling me from my thoughts as I looked over my sparse breakfast. You said you thought it was some sort of localized storm, I said. I don't know. It seemed like a neat fantasy. She toyed with her fingers on the table. I was bored, that's all. I didn't think those figures out there were even real. The idea of a top-secret governmental conspiracy got me excited. But I knew that was a tad far-fetched. Joan sighed. Of course it was. I was bored. Her voice had an apologetic tone. Plus, I had to have a reason to get you to come with me. It's alright, I assured her. It's a good thing we did what we did. There are frozen dead people out there, and at least five others. Darling joined us, sliding onto the bench table alongside Jones. Craziest stuff I've ever seen. That much, I can tell you. She was shaking her head. Finkel says we should go out there and get the others. She studied me and Jones. You share our grim duo. Darling cracked a grin. What do you guys think? There's some cereal freezer out there, right? A Jack Frost type. 
and going around and blasting people with a freeze ray or some stuff. There you go, Jones, I said. There's your top secret government experiment. They've got a freeze ray. Jones' mouth blinked a smile. It was a crummy situation for all of us. We were trying to keep our spirits up, I think. No easy task when there's a dead body in the other room. Darlene withdrew a deck of cards and I watched as the two women played a game of war. Their chatter filled the canteen and I was left thinking about that poor frozen soul in the infirmary. Who was it? Why were there frozen people out there in the blizzard? Why were they so eerie? Finkel entered the room and took it next to me, putting his hands over one another on the table. He stroked his beard and stared at the reflective surface of the bench table. What's up, Fink? asked Darlene. He sighed. It's Jensen. It took us a moment to realize what he was saying. Dr. Donald Jensen was one of the researchers that had left our facility days prior to the shift change. How is that possible? We had been in communication with the leaving team members up until the blizzard hit. They had already boarded the plane that would take them home. We had all said bye to one another over the radio. As far as we all knew, they were already back home. So, how was it that Jensen was sitting dead in the infirmary? He should have been hundreds of miles away. Well, Jones tossed her hand of cards onto the table, letting them splatter across the hard surface. I guess you were right, Andrew. Those are humans out there for sure. Finkel drummed his thumb against his leg. I suppose we should gather their bodies. This time, though, he glanced at me and Jones. We'll do it right. So, it was that that we gathered the other five statue people out of the thick storm outside, tilting them over so that we could more easily drag them along the ground like stiff boards. Donovan stood in the doorway, ushering and cheerleading us as me and the other three did the heavy lifting. None of us were surprised at the thawed faces we had found, after laying them out with the heaters in the infirmary. It was the other half of our team. Six people frozen to death. I've seen people lose fingers or toes to the cold, all black and brittle. I've even seen people receive permanent damage on their noses or ears from it. This was different though. They were frozen, but they had not lost the colors they had in life. It was uncomfortable to look at them. Considering Jones said she had seen them out there over the past few days, their skin should be unrecognizable. This wasn't your run-of-the-mill frostbite. Me and the rest of the living members of the team didn't mention it, opting instead to cast unsettled glances at one another. Finkel and Donovan took care of the bodies once they had softened, covering them in blankets and arranging them in the infirmary in a perfect line against the far wall from the door. Craziest stuff I've ever seen, Darlene said repeatedly. Jones, I think, felt guilty, and I attempted to comfort her, patting her on the shoulder. She gave me a stiff smile. It's not your fault, you know that right. I know, she said, her lips pulled tight. I just wish I would have said something earlier. Yeah, said Darlene. Without you, they would still be out there. We gathered in the canteen and shared in the chore of cooking. Strangely enough, the deaths of our team members did not settle a morbid silence over the room like I thought it would. If anything, the tragedy had strengthened our bonds in the canteen was filled with the smell of food and the noise of friendly conversation. Finkel disappeared and returned with a bottle of wine, popping the top and pouring us all glasses. We toasted to the dead and ate, played cards, talked about anything besides the corpses. Just as Finkel yawned himself out of the mess hall and Donovan soon followed, I realized that I was the third wheel in a game between Darling and Jones. We continued to play cards and broke into the cooking sherry. With our teeth stained red and Jones and Darling fondling each other's fingertips, I removed myself with a quick, good night, received with little protest. I returned to my room and stripped to my thermals, and then fell to sleep on a full warm stomach with a dizzy brain.
Maya woke to a biting chill in my room. Reaching for the bedside lamp and finding it dead, I sat up in my mess of blankets. After rummaging around in the drawer near the bed, I found a flashlight and turned it on. I could see my own breath in the cutting beam of light. Crap. I said aloud and reached for my clothes near the bed. Bundling up, I stumbled sleepily into the hall, squinting in the darkness with my guiding light. As I was wiping sleepers from my eyes, my light caught the surprised face of Donovan and he spun around, swinging his arms and letting out a yelp. I caught his wild hand and it was bone cold. Hey, he said, pushing the glasses up on the bridge of his nose and shirking his arm out of my grasp. Power's out. Yeah, any idea why? I don't know, I just woke up. Uh, me too. Darlene pushed her head from her bunk room, yawning. Jesus, it's freezing. She was stripped down to her undies and hid behind the bulky door. Oh, she said, looking at me and Donovan standing in the hall. What's with the power? Jones emerged from Darlene's room as well, wrapped in a quilt, peering at us from behind at the other woman, and covering her eyes as I shone the light in their direction. Quit it. Shine that somewhere else, please. I did. Finkel's grumbling voice could be heard from the far end of the hallway leading deeper into the facility. Someone's cut the main line, he said, eyeing each of us suspiciously on his approach. Don't look at me, said Donovan. I just woke up. Us too, said Jones and Darling in unison. I yawned my answer and then caught myself. Hey, Fink, what were you doing down there anyway? I was checking the breakers. I was going to see if I could find a way to flip the power back on once I had noticed it was off. But someone cut straight through the line. Uh, what about the backup, Jenny? I asked. Busted a crap. Looks like somebody beat it with a hammer. He said while shaking his head. Our ghostly breaths hung in the air as we all looked around the hallway. Was it possible that one of us had sabotaged our own life support? That couldn't have been it. No, we were all a bit jumpy from the frozen corpses. That was all. That's what made sense. Finkel circled his finger in the air. Everyone to the mess room. We settled into the bench tables in the canteen, gathering candles from the cupboards, lighting them, and placing them throughout the room so that everything cast long, dancing shadows. The wind outside only seemed to pick up and all of the place was lit in a warm glow. We were all chattering and shivering against a ticking clock. So, who's your money on there, Fink? Asked Darlene. If I had to guess, I'd say it's your military boy over there. She motioned to Donovan, who clenched his jaw and tapped his foot. Oh yeah? Said Donovan. Wouldn't surprise me if it was you. You're the only one here as a freelance contractor. What the heck does that have to do with anything? Asked Darlene. You're the weirdo that holes up in his room all day. Think, said Donovan. Why would I cut the power? I'm here too. I need heat. He rubbed his arms. It's freaking freezing. You really think that I would hurt myself just to freeze you out? Are you crazy? She mocked his protest, jabbering her hand in a pantomime fashion. Regardless, said Finkel. We're all here now. The power's out. Someone cut it. I can't imagine why any one of us would. Cobbs had been down for days and days now, so I can't fathom why whoever did it would add freezing to death to the list of things we have to worry about. I don't think any of us did it. He settled his lower back against the kitchen counter. Why would we? Maybe it was one of them, said Jones. We all knew what she meant. One of the frozen corpses we had hauled out of that terrible blizzard. Now's not the time for your wild imaginings, Jones, said Finkel while holding up his hand. I mean it. 
said Jones. Those things give me the heebie-jeebies. Those things, I said, are our team members in case you've forgotten. Jones glanced at me and I saw the injury in her eyes. I didn't mean it like that. I just meant... Her voice faltered and fell off. Thinking Andrew's right, said Donovan. Dead people aren't getting up and cutting our power. Don't be ridiculous. Darling chimed in. Oh yeah, I think Donovan's right. He would know, considering he's probably the one that did it. Donovan shook his head. Are you dense? We've gone over this. I would freeze too. Are you stupid or do you just like to pick fights for no reason? Darling stood, pointing a finger at Donovan. I know you're a creep. I've seen the way you look at me and Jen. You probably got a few marbles loose from that tour in Iraq. Saw some stuff over there, didn't you? Now you thought you would cut the power and take us out in our sleep. I've seen guys like you before. Totally normal and then one day, you flip a switch and then bam. She snapped her fingers. You murder an entire group of people. Her hand came down on the table in a swift smack. Donovan sat slowly, dumbfounded, mouth agape. That's enough, said Finkel, crossing his arms. It's cold, Notlin. It's only going to get colder. I glanced at the thermometer. Seven degrees Celsius. I guessed it would drop below zero within the hour. We need to insulate this room. If we stay together, we'll be warmer, if only a little. He too looked at the thermometer, shaking his head and checking the watch on his wrist. Gather up blankets, pillows, coats, scarves, anything and everything that might retain some heat. What about the dogs? asked Jones. What about them? asked Donovan. Forget them, they're dogs, they've got fur. Don't be like that, I spoke up. Don't be like what? Asked Donovan in a harassed way. She's over here talking about me cutting the power. He motioned to Darling. And now her little girlfriend is worried about some dumb animals. Am I dreaming or is everybody losing their dang minds? We'll bring the dogs in, said Finkel, adding. More warm bodies that way. I guess that makes sense, grumbled Donovan. Someone had to explain it to you in order for you to show a little compassion, I asked. I guess I'm the bad guy, he said. No one's the bad guy, said Finkel, stroking his peppered beard. We bundled into coats, jackets, gloves, and our respective rooms and returned to the canteen with piles of blankets and pillows. Darling and Jones took up a post nearest the kitchen area. I bedded down near the doorway leading into the hall a few feet from Finkel. Donovan sulked in the far corner. The two women left to gather the dogs. I offered to help, but they assured me they would be fine. I gathered a few nearby lit candles to stave off the chill permeating the room and tried cracking open metamorphosis again. Finkel cut this short, talking to me in a hushed whisper. I glanced at Donovan to be sure he wasn't listening. What do you think? He asked. About? I asked, setting the book to the side. About all of this? I don't know. I think it's cold. You know what I mean. Between you and me, I think one of us cut the power. I know it wasn't me. Well, how do you know it wasn't me? I asked him. He wheezed out a small chuckle, keeping his voice low. That is exactly why I don't think it's you, he said. Really? I cracked a grin. I haven't entirely ruled you out as a suspect either, boss man. He shifted and pulled up the hood of his parka and withdrew something from one of his inner coat pockets. I caught the shine of a flask and heard him unscrew it. He took a swig and offered it to me. It won't actually warm you up, but it'll help you forget that you're cold. I took it and sipped and then passed it back to him. Jeez, that's rank stuff. He chuckled. More for me then. 
He took a healthy drink and re-screwed the top, placing it somewhere within all those layers. I think it's Donovan, he sighed. I'm trying to keep everyone calm, but I really think it's him. I raised my brow. Really? Why? Tell me. Finkel shrugged. I trust you. The woman returned with the six sled dogs in tow. The pitter-pattering animals scrambled through the canteen, pushing their wet noses in every corner sniffing. The black and white, curly-furred dog came straight up to me, sticking its paws directly onto my lap and pressing its face into my neck. I could hear its heavy breathing as it smelled me. Hey there, Steve. Calm down. I pushed him down a little, and he settled near my feet, resting his eyes and exhaling softly. The wind continued to batter against the facility, and every so often, one of the dog's ears would perk up in attention, and then settle back down upon the realization that it was only the wind. Donovan settled into his corner with his back against a wall, and watched the rest of us over the top of a bug. Jones and Darling played cards while Finkel snored beside me. I wrapped my arms around my midsection and tried to drift off to sleep. Steve, the mutt, curled up beside me, and I threw a series of blankets over me and him. Good boy, I whispered into his ear. With some effort, I drifted into a sweating sleep without dreams. When I awoke, it was to the door to the canteen opening and closing. The noise of the door shutting in its frame creaked. I almost chalked it up to any other noise in my half-asleep bundle. Upon the realization of what it was, I stirred awake, startling Steve, and sending him into an alert, standing position. I looked around at the candlelit room. Finkel still snored. I blinked a few times and could see Jones and Big Spooning Darling, both dead to the world. Bingo. Donovan was gone. I shook Finkel and he opened his eyes with a snort. What? what? He said, eyes darting around wildly. Donovan. I pointed to the strewn mess of blankets in the corner. He's gone. Dang it. He shuffled to his feet and moved across the floor, shaking the woman until they ground and aroused. The other sled dogs watched him with mild interest, barely raising their heads to look his way. The research lead checked his watch. It's morning anyway. He was right, but it didn't feel like any of us had gotten enough sleep. I took my flashlight and cracked open the door to the hallway with Steve at my feet, peeking into the blackness. The others came over to the entrance of the canteen. I knew he was up to something, said Darling. I know it. Keep a cool head and don't jump to any conclusions, Finkel reminded. I pressed the door open and stepped into the hall with the others filing out with me. Where do you think he went? I asked to any one of them, hoping they would know. Here, I'll go with Darling and you go with Jones said Finkel. Check deeper in the facility and we'll head towards the entrance. I nodded this affirmation, and I could see Darling begin to open her mouth and protest, surely wanting to go with Jones, but Fink shot her a look that I couldn't quite catch. Darling clicked on her own light and they started off towards the entrance. Me and Jones were left there, watching them go until they met the set of stairs leading up at the end of the hall. You don't actually think Don's up to something, do you? Asked Jones as we began our way deeper into the dead freezing underground facility. I shrugged. Who knows? Hey, I know Darling's a bit harsh towards him and all, but I can't imagine that anyone on this team would actually try and kill any one of us. I could barely catch her hopeful childish eyes in the periphery of my flashlight's glow. He's a bit of an ass, but I don't think he's evil. Why does she hate him so much? I heard a soft sigh. She was married once to a military guy. She stopped me, grabbing my shoulder. Don't you tell her that I told you this, okay? Okay, 
I assured. They were really happy when they were dating teenagers. Years. The way she tells it is that her ex-husband was a really nice guy until he joined the army. There was a moment's pause as we continued at our turtle's pace, me shining my light into the depth of the hallway. After he came out of basic, he was worse. He apparently used to be a real soft-hearted young man. The military hardened him, turned him into a big callus. From the way that Joan spoke, I could decipher that she was repeating words once told to her. He became a control freak, wouldn't let her leave the house, wouldn't let her talk to friends or family. She felt all alone. And then he started hitting her. And no one was around for her to tell because of the way he had closed her off. I shook my head, keeping my eyes straight ahead. Dang. Yeah. Just then, some dark shadow darted across the circular beam of my light, and I choked on my own spit, stopping my feet abruptly and putting up an arm so Jones wouldn't walk past. You see that? See what? She craned her neck forward, scanning the dark hallway ahead. You didn't see that. No, are you sure you did? Got a touch of the madness, huh? Cabin fever or something. I could sense a smile beginning in her voice as she spoke the last word. But just as the thing darted across the hallway again, I could feel her stiffen in her place next to me. Holy crap! Her voice was frantic. You saw it that time, didn't you? I said this with more than just a smidge of arrogance. What was it? I didn't catch a good look at the thing. Hey! I shouted up ahead. I've got a gun. A lie, but I hope that it sounded convincing. You better come out now if you don't want to get shot. And that last sentence came out more like a quiver as the thing darted across again. I hadn't thought it was possible to feel colder in those sub-zero temperatures. But as the thing spoke in the darkness, I swear the blood in my body froze and threatened to harden me like those dead corpses we had brought in. It mocked my voice. I've got a gun, in a hissing voice. Quickly, I shot the light all around, hoping to catch the thing and see what it was. No matter how I tried, I could not find the thing. I've got a gun, it said again. Screw you, said Jones in a panic. I could feel her begin to shift and turn to run, but I grabbed a hold of her arm. I couldn't move from my position, and I was holding onto anything like a drowning person. Uh, let's go. Joan's voice cracked. Let's go, said the thing in a squeal. Joan shoved me so that I collided with the wall and I was broken for my spell. She was already pelting down the hall, away from me and the thing. I slipped into a sprint, pumping my legs until I could feel the fire there growing. My warm breath clung around my scarf as I panted and ran. She disappeared from the light that I held outstretched. Jones was gone and no matter how quickly I moved, I never seemed to catch up to her. The clatter of nails against the floor scratched behind and I dared not to look there. I didn't stop until I came to the door leading to the canteen and the noise of the creature behind was no longer audible. Darling and Finkel were there, bathed in darkness. I pounded my chest a bit with my fist, attempting to get my breathing out of control. Darling didn't even wait for me to catch my breath before peppering me with questions. Where's Jones? What happened? Where'd she go? My hands went numb. What do you mean? She didn't meet you guys. I scanned the dark hallway and shone my light back the way that I had come. There was nothing there. There was someone chasing me. She went up ahead and I lost her. I refused to meet their eyes. She should have met you guys before me. Silence lingered between us all and I could hear the crinkle of Darling's gloves as she squeezed her hands together. Are you sure you didn't miss her? I pleaded. We haven't seen another living soul, said Finkel. 
Not since we split up. He shook his head and looked down. I spun. Jones! I cried out and the name echoed back at me from the depths of the facility. Hey, Jones! I felt a hard hand on my shoulder and I turned to find Darling there squeezing me. Don't panic. She gave me a smile and for the briefest of moments, it honestly felt genuine. It's gonna be alright, don't panic. We'll find her. Knowing Jen, I'm sure she just got lost in the dark. Feeling myself not along, I said, Yeah, you're right. That's exactly something she would do. So, said Fink, Don and Jones are both missing now. We pulled our other dead team members out of the storm. He stroked his beard and shook his head. It was his turn to avert his eyes from ours. This is freaking rough. Pardon the French. Darling ignored his words and turned back to me. You said something was chasing you. That's right. Something in the dark, deeper in the facility. I couldn't move, it scared me so bad. And then Jones snapped me out of it and disappeared. What was it? She asked. Fink's interest peaked as well as they both stared directly at me, awaiting my explanation. But the only thing that I could offer was a small shrug. What did it look like? I didn't get a good look at the thing, I said. Come on. Fink opened the door to the canteen and slipped in, saying, Better to keep warm. Probably safer too. If she comes back, it'll be better that we're here. As we sat at one of the bench tables with these sled dogs shifting to lay at her feet, Steve clung to Darlene's side, keeping his snout buried under her hand. Darlene's knees bobbed wildly under the table, and I could see that tears were beginning to well in her eyes. I wanted to reach out and apologize. I told them of the thing that we had encountered deeper within the facility. It was a humanoid creature of some kind, I concluded. It seemed to be toying with us, like it was a joke. Its voice. I grimaced. Its voice was like a mischievous little elf or something. I know that's ridiculous to say. Fink hung on every word, and Darling rested her head against an arm propped by an elbow on the table. The lead researcher sat there, tugging at his beard as I explained what happened. You just left her there, sighed Darling. What? No, I didn't, I protested. She put up her hand. No, you're right. I'm sorry, Andrew. I'm just nervous is all. I reached across the table to touch her hand and calm her. She recoiled and winced. I'm sorry, I said. I know. I know you wouldn't have done that. I'm upset and I'm being cruel, she admitted. It's a bit of a reflex. I'm sure she's alright, said Fink. Darling caught her head sidelong to look at the older man. You're right, I'm sure. Her teeth showed in a soft smile and this time, it didn't feel quite so forced. She's a tough cookie. And then she hid her face behind a glove, and I caught Fink's eye while she dabbed her eyes silently. The older man wanted to tell me something. He had another bit of information, I could feel it. He had said that he had trusted me. Whether that trust was misplaced, I couldn't say for sure, but I knew what that look meant. Darlene drew Steve the dog up into her lap and I excused myself to the kitchen area of the room, hoping to find some potato chips to snack on. This also proved to be a good moment for Fink to speak with me candidly. He leaned in with a whisper and I flinched. I almost sent the bag of ruffles in my hands like gliding through the air. Hey. He continuously looked back over at Darling, who was beginning to nod off. Tears make you tired. That's something I've learned. I know what you saw down there. What? How do you mean? I mean... He took in a big gulp of oxygen and began to explain to me. That's a ninja. It would explain all of these strange happenings that have been going on. Excuse me. Don't look at me like that. He paused and reached into my open bag of chips. 
crisping one between his teeth slowly, and then went on with his explanation. I saw one once when I was much younger. Could hardly believe it myself. What the heck is a ninja? He held up his hand and closed his eyes, searching for the right words. They're a cryptid. I couldn't help it. At that very moment, I wanted to gasp out a laugh, but held it back. Please don't tell me you believe stuff like that. I believe in the ninja. I can't vouch for the things in this world I've not seen. But I have seen an ninja. They exist. I stood, mouth agape, and wiped my hands off of my pants, slipping back into my gloves and forgetting the bag of chips on the counter. I used to do a lot more work on boats. It was always more fun, I thought. Well, I ended up taking some work on a Japanese researching vessel. They had come up here and gathered data. It was a life experience, I'll tell you that much. You see, I always wanted to be a pirate when I was a kid. So, I figured working on a boat was about as close as I could get in the modern age. He grinned, hoping the joke had landed. It didn't. He huffed and grumbled, returning to his story. I was hired as a consultant of sorts, as I was already well seasoned at this point. I aided in mapping out the subaquatic terrain. We would check out different areas at different times in the year. Well, he stroked his peppered beard. There was this one time in the middle of the night, and all the Japanese fellows were making fun of me because I was calling Bumkiss on the folklore of the ninja. Totally bogus, I thought. And then I catch a glimpse of a man standing out there in that melting ice. The only problem is, it's not a man. I start losing my mind, screaming at my crewmates, telling them that we've got a man overboard. They ignore my scream, so I take over one of these spotlights on the port side and turn it over to look at the thing out on the ice. So? I asked. So, it was a ninja, he shrugged. They're troublemakers, or bad omens, gremlins, but instead of planes, they hang out in the Arctic and F with fishermen, Inuit communities, people like us secluded from the rest of the world. You're crazy. Fink laughed and withdrew his flask, taking a sip and rubbing his hands together. Whatever you say. Just then, a tapping came on the door of the canteen and every single dog in the room began whining low. The room felt colder as the candles went out. All hollow. I can't tell you how long we stood in the darkness like that. For time stopped having meaning there and I was instead left to count these seconds in blinks. The sharp inhale of air coming from Fink next to me was audible, and then everything was silent. Even the dogs dared not make a sound in those moments. My stomach dropped into the floor, and I waited for the next bit of noise to come. And then Darling spoke. Hello? It came from feet away and forced a spit to catch in my throat. I felt her hands come out and touch my arm, and I jumped. It's me, she said. Fink, Andrew. Her voice was small. I answered with a crack in my voice. I'm here. Andy, thank God. I felt the hand clench on my arm harder. Fink coughed as if to bring some normalcy back to the nature of our circumstances. I'm here. The older gentleman's voice was stern, gruff. I could hear the vague noise of him shuffling through his pockets. Still... The tapping on the canteen door rang through the open room. And then came a voice from the other side. Hello? Help! It was Jones. Jen! Hushed Darling. She was beginning to really dig into my arm. Hello? Help! Darling let go of me and started to move. I squinted through the blackness to make out the watercolor outline of her shadow to grab onto her so she could not go to the door. She attempted to jerk away from my grasp, but I was stalwart to my hold. 
and I could feel her move in the dark to look at me, so I held a finger to my lips. It took a second for me to realize how futile that was, so I spoke. That's not Jones. What the heck do you mean? She asked. Fink clicked his light on, and we were bathed in a small glow of it, and Darlene's eyes were panicked and pleading. I let go of her. Listen, I said. That thing is not Jones. Whoever is on the other side of that door, it's not good news for any of us. That's the thing or person or whatever that we ran into deeper in the facility. It sounds just like her. Darlene's eyes shot to the door once more. Andrew's right, said Fink. Whatever's out there is not human. I caught myself rolling my eyes. I don't know about all that, but we can't trust the person on the other side of that door. There was a pregnant silence among us in the canteen before Darlene approached the door leading out into the hallway. She put a flat hand against its metal surface. Jen? She called. Amber, please help me. I think there's something out here with me. It keeps moving around in the dark and I don't know where it is. Come out here with me. Darlene's eyes darted back to me to me and Fink. There was a questioning look in her face. We both shook our heads. She turned to the door. Why don't you just come in? It's not like the door's locked. You could just come in. There's no reason for me to come out there. A shrill bit of laughter rang from the other side of the door, and I recognized the mocking voice of the thing I had met deeper in the facility. As the chill played my spine like a xylophone, I knew that Fink was probably right. That was no human. You stupid. I'll kill you, it said. Darlene stepped away from the door and crossed the room to stand next to us. And then it was back to Jones's sweet lover's voice. Please, come out. Another echoing laughter that rang through the otherwise silent room, like an echoing insanity. Darlene twisted around to look at me and Fink. Do you think it got her? I opened my mouth to say something along the lines of, That's likely. But Fink placed a hand on my shoulder. Nah, he said. I'm sure she's fine. It's like you said. She's a tough cookie. Yeah, I said. The tapping slowed against the canteen door and we moved a bench table against the door. It eventually ceased altogether. The cold was cutting straight through us even in our many layers. Darlene's teeth chattered. My gloved fingers were as stiff as wood. And Fink kept sniffing. The sink of his flask began to swarm my nostrils and although it was pungent, I considered it a welcome distraction from the very real perils that faced us. I took it upon myself to begin distributing unopened kibble to the dogs. They greedily ate it up and even as the temperature dropped, the mood began to feel a little less dire. I turtled my arms and head into my layers and swathed myself in a wool blanket sitting on a pillow and surrounding myself with a few lit candles in what was once our dining area. Fink came over to sit by me and his cheeks were rosy from more than just the cold. As much as I liked the man, his drinking was beginning to bother me. We should be staying clear-headed and aware of our surroundings. I was idly aware of Darling rummaging around in the cabinets. Bingo! She shouted as she returned to meet us in the dining area. In one hand, she carried a spray canister, and in the other, she held a lighter. Whoa there, I choked. What do you think you're doing? I'm going out there. She was shaking, but I got the strange impression that it wasn't from the cold. She was working herself up to do something. Something big. Something dangerous. Something stupid. No, you're not. I was surprised at my own voice coming out so callous and rigid. There's only three of us left and you want to go out and make it too. Are you insane? I'm not insane. I'm not going to let that thing take over, she said. Comms are down, the power's out. 
Crap has full on hit the fan in case you've not noticed. We don't know when the blizzard will pass, but I do know that no one's coming for us. We have to fight back or we're as good as dead. Think. I twisted around to see the older man dead asleep. He was snoring. I was hoping that he would aid me in talking Darling down. So much for that. I turned to look back at Darling, but she was heading towards the door, sliding the bench table away from the entrance. Before I knew it, I was up on my feet and moving fast towards her. I reached out to grab her and her hand shot out, slapping me away. Hey, I said. What? You want to just hole up in here and wait for that thing to freeze us out? How long do you think we can wait around to die, huh? The only chance we've got is to get Jen and make our way out to the chopper. That's the only hope for us now. What about Donovan? I asked. Well, him too. She grated her teeth. No reason to leave him behind either, I guess. She flicked the lighter on and whipped the door open, readying the canister out in front of her stiffly. You can come along or you can die here. I don't care anymore. She wasn't going to listen to reason. I could see it in the glassy reflection of her wild eyes with the dim lighter flame. She disappeared down the dark hallway leading deeper into the facility. Crap, I whispered. I looked at Fink and sidled over to him, shaking him. Wh what said Fink, startled and swinging. Darling's gone. He started pulling himself to his feet, pushing off the wall. What are you talking about? I could hear his knees give off two pops as he went. Where'd she get off to? He wiped at his sleepy eyes. We've got to go get her. She's off her rocker. I was getting more panicked by the second. She's gone and she's going to get herself killed. Let's go. He staggered toward the door and blurry steps. As we entered the dark hallway, Steve, the curly-haired mutt, stuck his nose into the crack as we went to close the door to the canteen. I hunkered down and patted him across the back of his ears. I'll be right back, buddy. He whined but tucked his tail in and wandered to lay with the other dogs. The door shut and Fink shone his light left and right. What way did she go? Deeper, I pointed into the dark. He sniffled and we began walking. Fink carried a flashlight and I held a battery lantern out in front of me. It seemed that as we went, the light ate up the shrouding darkness ahead, and I felt that the place would swallow us up without hesitation, if it were given the inclination to do so. Neither one of us spoke. We simply waited to run into whatever in God's name waited for us in the dark. A sharp yell came from somewhere in front of us. A man scream. My blood ran cold and as I glanced at Fink, I could see that he was just as bothered by the sound as I was. Our pace accelerated and in no time at all we came across Donovan sitting in the hallway. It freaking hurts, hissed Donovan. It took me a moment to realize what was the matter. He wasn't wearing his glasses, they were strewn to his feet. That crazy lady tried to kill me. I hunkered down as Fink kept a lookout. What happened? Where have you been? Those things. They look just like us. What's that mean? I looked at his face and he jerked it to the side. The whole right side of his face was bubbled and blistered. What the? He yelled at me. Back off. The last traces of warmth in my body ran into my feet. He was holding a pistol in his hand. I put up my hands. Hey, Don, there's no reason for you to be waving that around, all right? Fink interjected. Put the gun down. Keeping us in his one good eye, he scrambled to replace the glasses onto his face. I could see they were cracked. How do I know you're not one of those things? Fink was shouting. How do we know you're not? You two just stay right there and don't make a move. I wagered a response. What happened to your face? Did one of those things get you? Donovan chuckled sickly. No, it's her, darling. 
One minute, I'm running from you guys, and the next, I slam into her in the dark. Guess she thought I was one of those things. He tested a prod against the blister on the right side of his face with his free hand. It nearly blinded me. Fink spoke. You were running from us. Yeah, you guys were chasing me. It seemed no matter how many rounds I emptied into your bodies, you just kept coming. That wasn't us, I said. Donovan looked us over, no doubt studying our clothes for traces of bullet holes. No crap. Do you believe we're really us? I asked. Fat chance I believe anything anymore. He sounded hoarse. His voice caught in his throat. If he had been a weaker man, this would have been the moment he broke into tears. He kept his resolve while his gun wavered until he finally let it sink into his lap. I guess you guys are who you say you are. There was a pause. Besides, he threw the gun into the shadows. I'm out of bullets, so I guess if you want to kill me, you should do it now. We're not going to kill you, said Fang. Well then give me a hand. I reached down and helped Donovan to his feet. Even if he wasn't my favorite person in the world, it felt good to be in a trio again. And he had had combat experience. We continued our adventure with me in front, Donovan in the middle, and Fink bringing up the rear. What do you think those things are? Asked Don. Ninjins, said Fink. I was willing to believe anything. That's just human in Japanese, said Don. Those things are doppelgangers. You haven't seen nothing till you catch yourself running around in the dark. You saw yourself, I asked. That's right, he said. Saw you and Fink too. How many? I asked the question I already knew the answer to. Let me show you guys something. Don took the lead and we slowly made our way into the infirmary. As we shut the door behind us and began to shine our lights around the room, it was obvious the bodies of our team members had disappeared. Those things weren't our team members. Donovan said the obvious aloud. We kicked the blankets they had been wrapped in and opted to exit the hallway. Don grabbed a hacksaw off one of the tables on our way out and I slipped a hammer into my pocket. Fink stayed quiet. I didn't want to accidentally kill anyone, but Don seemed to have no problem wielding the saw out in front of him. I wasn't sure how much damage something like that could even do if he got the chance. It's freaking cold. I tried pulling my scarf up to cover my mouth and nose. No crap, said Don. We took the small set of stairs leading into the underground storage. We passed by jerry cans, instruments, and excess food stored on shelves. As we passed by a shelving unit of dry kibble, we heard a rattling from behind it. We stopped and pivoted to shine our lights at the thing that must have been back there. All was dead quiet as we watched and waited. Nothing showed itself. Just as I relaxed my shoulders, that hissing, mocking voice of one of those creatures belted out the words. It's cold. It's so cold. And the shelving unit was shoved by some unseen force. I dove out of the way, scrambling past Don. Don sidestepped it. Fink let out a wailing cry as the shelving unit pinned him. I twisted around, trying to shove my frozen hand into my pocket to withdraw the hammer that I had placed there. I heard the pitter-patter of the creature's feet. It was a darting among us in the dark. I'll get you! Screamed Don like a madman. He too disappeared into the shadows, giving chase to the creature. I heard his hard boots disappear somewhere towards these stairs that had brought us down there. He was gone. I moved on hands and knees with the hammer dangling limply in my right hand. As I met the overturned shelving unit, I heard Fink trying to pull himself from beneath it. That smarts, said the older man. I stood, trying to prop the shelving unit back into its feet. After tilting the bent metal at an awkward angle, it seemed like it would stand properly. I reached down and tried lifting Fink to his feet by slipping an arm beneath his armpit. 
Are you all right? I whispered. The shriek of a woman echoed through the facility. That was something to worry about after we regrouped. I think so. His breath came out in a great white puff. I don't think anything's broken, but I can already feel my ankle swelling up. That's all right. I reached down to lift my lantern. You can lean on me. Let's go back upstairs. The movement was slow with Fink, forced to shuffle his feet in small steps. We made our way to the landing of the stairs and stepped into the mouth of the main hall. I could just barely see the outline of something ahead. It looked like a person crouched in the center of the hallway. I called out to the kneeling figure on approach. Donovan, is that you? The figure didn't move. Darling, Jones. No movement. Fink tried. Hey. We approached slowly, and as the light met the scene properly, I choked back my vomit at the smell. I knew what it was. Blood. It was like copper in the air. It seemed the figure was hard at work, pumping its arm. The sound of wet crunching met my ears. Donovan twisted around, still on his knees and held up the severed head of junior researcher Jennifer Jones. I got one of them, he said. Christ, said Fink. Me and Fink stood in the hallway, looking at Don crouched over the twitching body of Jones. An affinity of silence stretched between us. Don wore a wicked smile and for the first time, I understood the possibilities that polar madness could offer. What have you done? That was Fink. My words were still caught somewhere in the back of my throat. I was hyper-focused on the dead face of my friend. What are you talking about? Asked Don. I got one of those little things. Look at it. He stood and offered the head of Jones out for us to see more closely. I don't think that's one of them, I spoke. Look at it, said Don. There was a long pause before he let the severed head thump to his feet. I know what's going on here. His words were soft, lingering, insane. I'm the only real one left, aren't I? He cocked his head to the side as though he was waiting for a response. You need to calm down, said Fink. You've already killed one of us. He motioned to the dead body. Look, snap out of it. Don took a step towards us, forcing a flinch out of me. I did not want to be anywhere near him. Don't come any closer, I said. Why, said Don. If you're the real you, you shouldn't have any issues being near me. I could see in his eyes that he had already made up his mind. He didn't think we were real. Just back up, Don, I said. Please, don't come any closer. Just let me get a good look at you, he responded. I want to make sure you're all human. He took another step forward. I'm serious, stay away from us, I said. I wasn't sure if I would be able to fight him off with Fink leaning on me, so I shifted around to hand my lantern off to the older man. I'd be able to whack him with the hammer if it seriously came down to it. I didn't want it to come to that. Don moved quickly, charging at us. Without any other options, I shoved Fink off my shoulder so that he bounced off the wall and fell to the floor. Don came straight for me, wielding his hacksaw in his right hand. His left hand came out from my throat. I swung the hammer and it met his groping left hand. He let out a howl and swung the hacksaw at me. If he were able to grapple me, I was sure his superior strength would win out. I ducked, feeling the hacksaw catch on my hood. Without thinking, and only the driving force of adrenaline pumping through my muscles, I swung the hammer at his knee as hard as I could. It made a god-awful crunch and he spun like a wild ballerina, falling and sliding down the stairs to the basement. I shimmied away from the landing of the stairs and found Fink still holding onto the lantern. We ran from the scene like we were a three-legged race, all the while Don screamed at us, 
His words echoed off the metal walls. You can't leave me down here. They'll kill me. We stepped around the body of Jones. Her blood pooled thickly around the spot where her head should have been. As Don's screams fell away into the distance, we slammed into the door of the canteen, huffing and out of breath. I shoved at the door. I could hear something inside of the canteen. Shuffling feet could be heard as something or someone approached the other side of the door. The door swung open, leaving me and Fink to go flailing into the room, landing on our knees. The door slammed shut behind us. Looking around, I saw in the dim candlelight that the dogs were still there. Good. I twisted to see who it was who had shut the door. It was Jones. She was grinning. Next to her was Darling, and as I whipped my head around to the kitchen area, I saw Donovan munching on a snack cake. I moved to settle Fink onto a mess of blankets and stood. Thanks, he said. But as I caught his eyes, I knew he was thinking the same thing I was. How was any of this possible? I stood by Fink, pushing my back to the wall. Are you alright? Asked Darling, hunkering down to check Fink's ankle. I think so, said Fink. Probably need to ice it. He seemed to think this was funny because it was followed by a sick laugh. What about you? Asked Jones. She was looking at me. Are you okay? She looked genuinely worried. What a master of infiltration those things must be. I almost believed it myself. Either way, I knew what she meant. I was shaking. As I looked down to my hands, they were quivering. The hammer that I held was splattered in Don's blood. At least I thought it was his blood. My eyes darted back to Don, standing on the opposite side of the room. I'm good. I watched them all bug-eyed. It felt that at any moment, three creatures would spring into action. The weight was the worst part. Darling pushed Fink's pant leg up, exposing a red angle that would inevitably purple over. Why don't you put that thing down, said Don, stepping over to inspect me. He was talking about my hammer. I really don't want to, I said. You're among friends here. There's no reason for that, he responded. You know what? I'm good, actually. I looked him over, hoping that there was some small thing that I could latch onto, and noticed that it would give away the fact that he was in fact a doppelganger. Come on. Don stepped over to reach for the hammer. I jerked it away. His face bunched up. Quit acting like a crazy person. Leave Andrew alone, said Darling. Don winced at this and stepped away. Fine. I guess I'm always the bad guy. I choked out the words. The last time I saw you, you were all burnt up. Me? Said Donovan. Really? Is that so? Yes. I threw you down the basement steps. So excuse me if I think you might not be who you say you are. I shifted to look at Jones. And the last time that I saw you, you had no head. Jones looked at me with a stunned expression. Really? You don't trust me? Darling was watching me. I could feel her eyes penetrating me. There's gotta be some sort of test, right? She said. There's always a test in the movies. This isn't a movie, said Fink. The room went still except for the dogs. Steve, the curly-haired mutt, came over to stand near me. It felt good to have him nearby. If I could trust anyone, it felt like it was man's best friend, right? I pet him as Fink massaged his ankle. The other three people in the room took up on one of the bench tables near the kitchen, talking amongst themselves. Fink took one last swig from his flask and tossed it across the room, forcing the dogs to perk up their ears at the strange hollow metallic noise. Empty, he grumbled. This is bad, Andy. He whispered to me. How are we supposed to know who's who? 
No idea, he said. Well, if they're really an engine, I couldn't believe the words that were coming out of my mouth. There should be some sort of test like Darling said, right? Heck if I know, he shrugged. I'm not a cryptid zoologist. The tension in the room was swelling, and as the other three came over to sit near us, I could feel the pounding on my heartbeat to my ears. An idea sprang to mind. Hey, Jones, I said. Yeah, she asked. What's this dog's name? I asked while pointing to Steve. That's Steve. A million thoughts ran through my head. Think of something. What's the capital of the United States? Washington, D.C. What's my favorite color? I asked. How am I supposed to know that? You never told me that. I guess not. Darlene sprang into action. Andrew, calm down, all right. Jen is who she says she is. How can you tell that? I said. The only person that I can vouch for without a doubt is Fink over here. He's been with me the entire time. I could see the spark in Darlene's eyes. She was getting upset. How do we know you two aren't the fakes? Hey, said Don. Yeah, how do we know that you are who you say you are? Fantastic question, said Fink. No idea, he chuckled. You better kill us now. I wanted to reach over and throttle the senior researcher. We're real, I pleaded. A moment of silence. Since when did you two get so buddy-buddy? I asked while wiggling my finger between Darling and Don. Jones interjected. Now is not the time to start pointing fingers at each other. I think we're safe in here. You shouldn't have a freaking head. I was shaking. I saw Don saw your freaking head off. Jones glanced at Don. Is that right? Don laughed hysterically. What? Why the heck would I do something like that? I don't know, said Darlene. You do strike me as the type that would fly off the handle given the chance. Oh, screw off. Don crossed his arms. I don't know what vendetta you've got against veterans, but that needs to stop. You were in the military, asked Jones. Well, yeah, said Don. The next words came out of his mouth very slowly. You know that. Everyone backed away from Jones, creating a semicircle around her. Darlene was looking at her lover with wild skepticism. What? said Jones, attempting to give a wiry smile. All eyes were on her. I'll be damned, said Fink. Good try. Darlene spoke with an edge to her words. Where did I grow up? Um... Jones seemed to mull the question over. Darlene lifted her spray canister and flicked her lighter on. What town did I grow up in, Jen? The cracking sadness in her voice was immeasurable. Please, said Jones. You know me. I love you. Blinding fire shot on a line from Darlene to Jones. I shielded my eyes with a forearm and could barely make out Donovan and the commotion as he stumbled away. Jones's vocal cords ripped through the room, and the dogs began barking. The smell of crackling flesh filled the room, and then came the smoke. I love you, I love you, screeched Jones. She threw open the door to the canteen, and the bellowing smoke went with her. She was a human torch. We stepped into the hallway, watching her run towards the entrance of the facility. She disappeared out of sight, and her screams became echoes as we shut the door to the canteen once more. Darlene was crying silently. Don sat on one of the tabletops, watching his hands. I moved to Darlene. I'm so sorry, I said. Shut up. Her voice was sharp. Just leave me alone, Andrew. We have to make a run for the chopper now, said Don. I regretfully agreed. He's right. I leaned against the wall near Fink. I don't think I can fly in this storm, said Darlene from a million miles away. We've got to try, said Don. Why don't you try shutting your mouth, 
said Darling. Hey, I'm sorry, okay, said Don. But there are still people here that we can save. You're the pilot and we need you. A long sigh fell out of Darling as her shoulder slumped. All right, okay. Fink tried at sliding up the wall so that he could stand appropriately. He still favored his injured ankle. If we're going, I need to grab something for my room. Are you kidding me? said Don. There are more important things to worry about than some trinkets from your better days, old man. Fink glared, stone cold sober. It's my wife's wedding ring. I didn't know you were married, I said. Fink closed his eyes. She's been dead for some time. Well, I'm not going with you, and I don't assume you'll be able to make it there on your own with that ankle of yours, said Don. I studied Don's face. He seemed like the real deal, but after what had happened to Jones, I can't say I knew anything for sure anymore. The next words that came out of my mouth surprised even me. I'll go with you, Fink. Thank you. He wobbled over near me. I think I can manage to walk on my own, just barely. I gotta be careful is all. So that means we're splitting up again, said Don. He clapped. Fantastic idea, great. Thanks a lot for that one. It might be faster if we do, said Fink. Yeah, said Don. It might also get a lot more confusing too. Me and Don will make sure the line leading out to the chopper is still intact. Darling shot me a look. Just be quick. I don't want to lose anyone else if we can help it. And what if you're one of those things? Asked Don. Darling shrugged. What if you are? We set out. Me and Fink heading deeper into the facility. Before leaving the canteen door, I watched Don and Darling go until I couldn't see them anymore. Let's go. Thank you, Andrew, said Fink. It means a lot. Don't worry about it. It was slow going with Fink keeping the weight off his ankle by keeping a gloved hand on the wall. We passed by the spot that we had initially found Don sitting in, the place he had been burned. My mind flashed to those two out in the blizzard, and I hoped like mad that neither one of them were doppelgangers. My foot met something in the dark and I leaned down to see what it was. Fink stopped, holding the lantern up high so that as to illuminate the immediate area. It was the pistol he possibly doppled on had dropped. I lifted it to my face and inspected it. It was still fully loaded. So that Don had lied about the gun. It made me feel a little bit better about crippling his knee. I slipped the hammer into my pocket and aimed the gun ahead. I didn't care anymore. If anything came out of the dark, I would fire immediately. We met the part of the hallway where the bunk rooms were, and as we came upon Fink's, I told him to keep a lookout while I opened the door. A sick feeling in the pit of my stomach swelled and I couldn't figure out why. Something wasn't right. I swung the door in and the lantern light spilled into the bunk room. My scream caught. I couldn't say anything. There was someone sitting at Fink's desk adjacent his bed. Hey! I screamed at the figure sitting there. Don't move. I've got a gun on you. It did not move. I approached carefully and rounded its shoulder so that I could see its face. It was Anthony Finkel, lead researcher. He was cold to the touch and a small line of frozen blood had pulled around his temples. I whipped my head around to see Fink standing in the doorway. His figure was blotted out by the light he held in his outstretched hand, but I could see that his shadowy form didn't need the assistance of a wall anymore. His ankle was fine. Not you, I cried out. He threw the battery-powered lantern directly into my face and it met my forehead just as I squeezed the trigger of the pistol in my hand. Fink let out a groan but before I knew it, he was straddling me and I was on the floor. The dead Fink toppled out of the chair in our struggle. The living Fink brought his knee to meet me directly in the groin 
and I tried slipping the gun beneath his chin. He grabbed the barrel, pointing it directly at the ceiling. I squeezed the trigger two more times, and the room was coated in a mesmerizing disco flash as his free hand began finding my throat. Tears pulled in my eyes. I couldn't breathe. I was going lightheaded, and my vision began to pinhole. In one last, desperate hope, I reached into my pocket. The hammer met his head, and he rolled off me. I scrambled to where the door was, pointing the gun at the threshold. I could barely make out his outline in the low light of the strewn lantern. As he approached the doorway, I fired the gun until I couldn't anymore. The shots rang in my ears and I could hear nothing. I watched as he tumbled to the floor. I ran towards the entrance, throwing the gun as I went. I held the hammer, readying it so that if anything came from the shadows, I would immediately smash its head in. I tipped over a solid object and I heard the thing let out a whimper. I reared the hammer back as I waited for the thing to find me in the pitch black. A warm tongue met my face. I relaxed and scratched Steve around his ear. The dogs. We had totally forgotten about the dogs. Come on, boy, stay close. I took my steps more deliberately, feeling along the wall until I saw the open door of the canteen ahead. Some small candle glow came from there, and I ran towards it in a mad gamble. Upon meeting the threshold, I saw the canteen was empty. Crap, I said. Steve stayed close behind. Maybe we could come back for the other dogs. I dashed towards the entrance and it felt good to hear the paws of Steve behind. Upon climbing the stairs to the entrance, I passed by a blackened figure. That must have been the fake Jones's body. I ignored it and as the light coming from the windows of the entrance illuminated my surroundings, I felt a bit better. With only the thoughts of survival in my mind, I threw the door open and barreled into the blizzard once more, keeping my hold on Steve's collar. I could hardly see a thing, but I found the line leading out to the chopper. I moved, keeping one hand on the dog and the other on the line. The snow blindness was overwhelming, but I would be damned if I didn't keep a hard grip on that line. Just over the sound of the whipping snow, I heard Steve barking wildly. I looked at him and saw that he had buried his snout in the snow. I leaned on close, searching for the thing that he had found in the snow and saw the frozen face of Donovan staring up at me. He had been cheered clean and two across his waist. There was no time to mourn. I could feel the heat of the cold attempting to trick me and I pulled Steve along with me. I'm sure I was choking him, but I did not want to leave him. I did not want to be alone. Through the wind of the storm, I saw the outline of the chopper. I picked up my speed, lifting my legs to fight against the gathered snow. Everything burned. I slapped against the door of the helicopter and felt around to find the handle. I tore it open, dropping my hammer somewhere. Steve dove into the cabin as I fought with the wind to keep the door open. I followed the dog and the storm slammed shut behind me. Darling was sitting in the pilot's chair. You made it. There was a small bit of elation in her voice. She looked at me puzzled. Where's Fink? He is one of them. I said exasperated, trying to catch my breath. The cold forced a cough out of me, and I could barely stop hacking. Did you see Don on your way? I lost him somewhere out there. She nodded to the white, hellish landscape. I nodded manically. He was half buried in the snow. I think they got him. She began flipping knobs. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think they cut the gas line. She fell back in her chair before slapping the steering console in front of her. Come on, can't one thing just go right? I shook my head and focused on the dog attempting to bury its snout in between my legs. Darling looked at me. You are you, aren't you? I think so. I scratched Steve's head, trying to distract myself from exactly how screwed we were. Are you, you? Probably, she chortled. 
Screw this. She pounded the steering console again, but peeked up as she looked out the windshield of the helicopter. I followed her eye line. You see that out there? She squinted and leaned forward without breaking her gaze from what she was looking at. I did, but to be certain, I wiped the frost, gathered around the windows, and pressed my face close to the glass, cupping my hands. There is a semicircle of humanoid figures standing in the blizzard, unmoving.